As a beach cleaner, you find a lot of strange things. Once I found two kilos of cocaine <laughs> washed up on a remote beach on Galapagos. It was just lying there next to some plastic debris, but with a street value of more than six times more than the average wage per year among the locals. And Galapagos, whew, it was a crazy place at the time with a small-scale war between the national park and poor fishermen who had turned into eco-pirates. They would kidnap giant tortoises for ransom and hide away in mangrove labyrinths where they would process illegally harvested sea cucumbers, a small phallus-like animal on the sea bottom, which plays an important role in the ecosystem. And prostitutes would be paid in bags with these animals, which they sold as aphrodisiacs to the Asian market, alongside the private parts of sea lions. But the National Park fought back, aided by the eco-warrior Paul Watson, who had recently run into a fishing vessel in Norway to sink it. Together, they stopped boats and confiscated hundreds of thousands of sea cucumbers and shark fins on Galapagos. But the rangers were ambushed by the pirates who shot one of them and left, them for, left him for dead. So this was serious business. So you can imagine the horror when the leader of our beach cleanup expedition decided to call up the Coast Guard on the open radio to inform them that we had two kilos of cocaine aboard the ship, along with the precise GPS location of our boats. She thought that if we just pour the cocaine into the water, it would kill some fish. I could just see the face of the captain turn pale. Considering the street value of the drugs, and how close we were to the pirate camps, he realized that we were in a dangerous situation and decided that we had to make a run for it. So we raised the anchor and navigated all night with the lights off, stopping the engine every now and then to listen for other boats. And nobody got any sleep that night. Whenever we would hear another boat, we would just lie dead still and make sure it had passed. But after a long and hazardous journey, we managed to turn the drugs over to the Coast Guard and continue our expedition. And this, this was my first experience with beach cleanups. <laughs> Volunteering to clean up illegal, plastic-filled pirate camps in the middle of a strange eco-war between the National Park and parts of the local community. The, the story reflects the challenge that beach cleanups were outsourced to a handful of international volunteers without properly involving the local community. To most of them, marine plastic pollution was somebody else's problem, not theirs. How could we change this? Fast forward 15, 20 years, and something else is washed up on a beach somewhere in the world. This time, a goose-beaked whale with its stomach filled with plastic. Through the magic of social media, this plastic whale became a symbol of a global movement against marine plastic pollution. Around this time, an old friend of mine by the name of Roger Enneboom, who had worked as a volunteer at the local bird watching station for years, told me that he wanted to clean all the beaches in Raya National Park in southern Norway by himself. Now, this is a tremendous task. The national park covers more than 600 square kilometers across three municipalities, and plastic dating back to the 1950s was still lying around on the beaches. The experiences from Galapagos came back to me. Rather than outsourcing the task to people like Roger, how could we involve the entire local community? This became the start of, a, of an action research project that went on for years. 
It was all about co-creation and finding solutions to common problems together and facilitating the sort of active citizenship that the authorities had been talking about for years. Surely Roger was one of these active citizens, but how could we connect his resources with those of others in the local community? I think we came up with a good name for the project, Våre Strender, Our Beaches. It reflects the co-creative approach, but also the wonderful legal right of every citizen in Norway to move freely in the outfields, regardless of who the owner of the land is. These truly are our beaches. Now, organizing a beach cleanup event may sound simple enough, but it is surprisingly complicated. There are a number of confusing rules and regulations you have to consider. People have been reported to the police for going ashore on the wrong island at the wrong time of year to pick up plastic. International organizations like Ocean Conservancy have compiled extensive task lists for uh, beach cleanups with bullet points stretching across several, point, uh, several pages, uh, including acquiring the correct permissions, how to recruit volunteers, a list of equipment, uh, how to upcycle the, the trash, and so on and so on. And how to deal with pirates wasn't even on the list. There were no guarantees that, that uh, volunteers would show up either. Most people supported our task in principle, but it always seemed to compete with something else. I'd like to help, but we're going to the cabin this weekend. Fair enough, but there were potentially 365 beach cleanup days a year, the way we saw it. So how could we facilitate a way for people to contribute on their own schedule? In other words, how could we create a self-organized system? I remembered a fascinating article I once read in National Geographic about swarm intelligence. Swarms of bees and schools of fish and flocks of birds are able to achieve things that no single bee, bird or fish is capable of on its own. Yet, they have no leaders. Take the ant. The queen does not command her workers. Rather, when an ant finds food, it releases pheromones, producing an odor which attracts other ants to the area. The workers proceed to systematically collect all the food until it's gone, at which point they stop releasing these pheromones, thereby enticing the ants to to look in other areas for food. In other words, they follow a set of very simple rules and act on information in their immediate surroundings. During the last decade or so, these principles of leaderless organization among swarms have been transferred into human tasks such as scheduling air traffic, transporting goods and coordinating military robots. Could this principle be applied to beach cleanups as well? We did some research on experiences from international beach cleanup organizations and came up with a couple of things to test out locally. The first was to provide the local community with ownership to specific areas by inviting them to adopt their own beach or stretch of coast or river and clean it a couple of times a year whenever it fit their schedule. Working hard on this, Within a couple of years, more than 80 places around the national park were adopted by NGOs, local businesses, families, groups of friends, all taking care of their beaches. The second thing, which was based on an idea that Roger had, was to place cleanup equipment at locations where people like to go. Let's say you're on the beach and you find some plastic what do you do? Well, we looked into it and found that in the UK, there are small stations with beach cleanup equipment in public areas, often with a guardian to look after it. So we collaborated with the municipalities and the national park and a local eco uh, business called RAG to place 
blue boxes with cleanup equipment around more than 30 places in the national park. This system turned out to be great during the pandemics when NGOs had to cancel their activities, but groups of friends and families could still do some cleaning. But what about the more remote areas that are difficult to find or difficult to access or less popular to visit? This is where swarm intelligence goes into the future because Holnor Gerent created an app in which you can mark polluted beaches in an interactive map. You can also find which beaches are adopted, where to find beach cleanup equipment, and where the next cleanup uh, event is taking place. So this was a tremendous tool for the sort of self-organized system that we were thinking about. But there was one more thing. What if we stopped thinking about beach cleanups as beach cleanups? That it was just about picking up trash. What if we also regarded it as an opportunity to get together, do something meaningful, meet interesting people, get some fresh air, do some exercise in beautiful locations. We start to collaborate with the local community to think about beach cleanups as an arena for inclusion and active citizenship involving refugees, people serving community sentences, people outside the labor force, drug users, mentally impaired. As as humans, we all have an innate need to matter to others, to feel significant. And our research found that these beach cleaners felt connected with other people participating in the cleanups, but also with a global movement against marine plastic pollution in which their resources were contributing in a positive way, which is a great feeling. So the problem on Galapagos all those years ago was that the local community was not properly involved. It was somebody else's problem, not theirs. Our solution was to facilitate a way for the local community to have a sense of ownership to our beaches and facilitate a way for active citizens to co-create the solution with NGOs, local businesses, and the authorities. It's not a perfect system, but what we need is a global swarm to deal with this problem. Aided by rules and regulations and innovations to prevent that the plastic ends up on the beaches in the first place. Ironically, in our part of the world, some people, some beach cleaners have now started to talk about themselves as pirates. So we've turned the whole thing around. All I know is that whatever we find floating ashore on the beach, I'm sure that we'll continue to deal with it together. So thank you all. Tuck.